Cool. Well, we'll get started. Uh, thanks everyone for joining on this uh, nice, nice little Saturday here in Calgary. Uh, being a pretty crazy week in the market, so appreciate you all uh, joining in. A couple disclosures. Um, I'm not an investment advisor. Uh, this is all my opinion and and just stuff I've seen kind of over the last couple of weeks. Um, stuff I've been tracking over the years. And, um, you know, please don't take this as investment advice. It's my opinion, my two cents, uh, data and trends that I like to share. Um, please do your own due diligence on, on kind of what's being, being presented here. And as always, everyone's risk tolerance is, is different. So, you know, kind of invest accordingly um, based on that. And it'll be about a two hour session on, on the macro outlook. I'll cover the inventories worldwide, uh, supply, demand, which are kind of the big three that matter in this picture. And then um, we'll, uh, we'll, get, we'll take a little break, 15 minute break, and then we'll get started with our company's valuations. So we'll be doing Meg Energy, Cardinal, and then I3 Energy. And then I'll open it up to questions. I know there was there were some people who wanted to ask some other questions uh, unrelated to this uh, at the end, so I'm happy to take that and uh, kind of go from there. Um, for for those who've joined for this before, uh, you kind of know the format. So um, the files for the for the company, you'll need the corporate presentations and the Q3 reports from the company website, and the Excel file is on the website again at whitetundra.ca at the bottom. It's labeled as a um, Excel seminar calculation file. So, so if you would like to follow along with the with the exact um, calculations that we're doing, then uh, that would be the best way. But we'll get started on the on the macro side. Can everyone on Twitter hear me fine? Yep. Cool. So, from a WTI standpoint, uh, which is our, our American oil. Um, index, we're, we're looking very, very good from a five-year standpoint. We're, we're well above the, the five-year average. We've had a little dip here in the last couple of days with, uh, with an absolute collapse on the, on the tech side of things. And, you know, the, the crypto and such, a lot of money leaving the market, liquidity leaving the market. But WTI has, has held in fine. Uh, we're sit still sitting well above our five-year range, um, looking very good at a price where Companies are making a lot of cash, a lot of free cash. Um, the companies have leaned down over the years, so their operating costs are lower, their, their GNA costs are lower. So things are looking very good um, on that side. Uh, switching to natural gas, again, we've had a little dip with uh, extremely warm weather um, over the last, last few months, but, but we're seeing cold spells kind of come in here and there. And if you look at the chart, the 20-year the chart on, uh, on natural gas, the, the Henry Hub uh, chart, we're still sitting pretty good. We haven't seen this kind of pricing till since kind of the, the 2014 levels. And, you know, it's been kind of a, a struggle really for the last, for the last little bit um, with, with a lot of producers kind of not making money or, or the gas price being very close to where they, they end up being profitable. So, you know, every extra dollar, or 50 cents that we go above, it's it's all free cash, uh, free cash flow. So so things are looking good from the natural gas producer standpoint as well. Uh, we switched to the Canadian pricing. So on the top we here we have Canadian condensate, which has kind of been trading at a very very good price, trading at a premium to WTI by about two to three dollars uh, US. So at last check it was at 86 more than 86 dollars US, which is absolutely incredible. Um, for the producers that are selling condensate. And uh, we look at WCS, kind of the same thing. Uh, the differentials have been very tight. We're looking uh, very, very good um, from that standpoint. Uh, $71 US uh, for, for barrel of WCS. If you had asked someone, you know, if they would see that last year, if they'd be happy with that, I, I think they would be uh, dreaming. So, you know, looking very good from a Canadian oil standpoint as well. And what makes it even better is that you know the the uh, USD to Canadian, which always used to go in line with the WTI pricing going up with with stronger oil pricing, has kind of diverged from that. 
So we see on this this 10 year WCS chart up top that during the glory days of, of 2010 to 2014, um, WCS in in US dollars was was roughly 80 to 85, somewhere between there, um, which if you look at, if you compare it to the USD to, to Canadian dollar chart, with it being at par, was roughly 85 to $90 Canadian. Well, now we're at $71 US with a with an exchange rate of 1.26. So that puts us at, at roughly the same place. We're, we're back to the highs of 2010 to 2014 on a Canadian dollar terms and, and we, we look poised to kind of continue higher. So um, for those saying that the oil price maybe has not gone back to those, those days of the past of the $100 oil and such, I mean, from a WCS standpoint, for any producer selling WCS, we're kind of already there. And, um, you know, that, that's really good. And that's one of the reasons why I prefer Canadian producers. And, and I'll talk about that um, kind of as I go along. On the Canadian gas side, we have ACO, which is the biggest hub hub in Canada, um, you know, prices are looking pretty good, about $4 uh, Canadian a gigajoule. You know, we have our usual summer dip looking into the future. And the strip has gone from being really backward dated on, on these gas contracts to now being relatively stable. Um, you know, and it, it has not changed very much, but if you look at it from a year ago, this yellow line, you know, we're, we're making a lot more money than, than we were predicting about a year ago. So looking very good. And a lot of Canadian producers are, are very, very lean. They're, they're free cash flow positive right down to a dollar echo, a dollar fifty echo. So, you know, some even lower maybe. So this is looking really good. It's it's finally some relief after many years of, of struggling with poor pricing, negative pricing in the summer and such. So again, looking good from that standpoint. And we look at the Dutch TTF European gas, which is which is one of the big hubs in uh, in Europe, and from the strip being at roughly twenty dollars about six months ago, it's now up to forty forty five, which is due to the European gas crisis that that no one really seems to be paying attention to uh, outside us us energy people. Uh, people are kind of doing their thing in Europe. They they don't seem to be affected by it quite yet. But when they do, it's going to be a shock because prices have just skyrocketed. And they've kind of been lucky that December and January has been warm so far because if, if they had another cold spell, it would be absolutely crazy, the money that some of these companies would be printing. So um, for any producers selling into the um, European market, again, looking very good. It's, it's a huge... Um, it's a huge benefit to, to them as well. And, and this TTF curve is the same as the NBP curve and, um, and kind of some of the other curves out there. So any European gas market, any Asian gas market are kind of having the same boost in cash flows to anyone selling into those markets. And the LNG producers also sell into those, those markets, the, the LNG ships that are going to uh, Europe and Asia. So let's begin on the on the inventory slide. So on the left here, we have worldwide global oil inventories. So, so it's strictly crude. We're down roughly 350 million barrels in, uh, in 2021, which is roughly a million barrels a day is a supply, supply demand kind of deficit on the crude side, which the curve never stopped going down. Despite OPEC adding production month by month, despite US producers adding production, Canada adding production, um, a lot of production coming online across the world. The, the demand was basically taking it all as, as the year went along. So, so that's a really good sign uh, from that standpoint. And you see that's, that's very different from any of these other, other year curves where, where we had builds and then we have kind of draws and such. It's just been consistently down. And if you look at it from crude plus products, it's kind of double that. It's roughly two million barrels a day. So, so we're we're drawing down roughly a million barrels a day of crude in 2021, and a million barrels a day of products. So products being uh, gasoline, diesel, jet fuel, propane, um, etc. So, you know, it's not just crude that's drawing down. It's it's all across the petroleum complex that we're seeing this drawdown, and we see this little this little point here 
is a blue is a 2022. Um, again, it's we're starting off the year drawing down again. So, you know, we're sitting well below the 2019, 2020, 2021 curves. And just looking like, you know, we're going to continue on this path until something something changes. So, um, you know, inventories are kind of our safety net from an oil standpoint. And the fact that we're sitting at such lows is uh, is is bullish for anyone invested and bearish for anyone uh, who's a consumer. <clears throat> Let's look at the U.S. specifically. So we have this yellow line <clears throat> is the is the American crude stockpile. So again, consistently down throughout the year. We're down roughly 175 to 200 million barrels over the year. So about half a million barrel a day uh, supply demand issue here. And again, 2022 starts off on the same, same track on this downward trend. Interestingly, th this line here at the bottom is a 2010 to 2014 average. So during the peak years of $120 oil, $100 oil, this is kind of the average where we were. And we're seeing that we're approaching this average uh, more and more as we kind of go along here. So again, looking looking very ominous in a way from that standpoint. And if we take this graph and we and we take it not not year to year, but from a rolling kind of average, um, you can see the level of drawdown we've had. It is just right off a cliff, and and there's nothing seems to be stopping this cliff. Like it is just week after week of decline, decline, decline. It and even the the seasonal November, December kind of slowdown in demand has, has not happened. We're seeing consistent decline uh, week over week, month over month. And, and where does this curve stop? Like where we are right now is, is already, you know, approaching this 2010 to 2014 level. And, you know, demand now is 10% above this level. So if you compare inventories to like, how many days of demand do we have left in inventory? It's actually 10% lower already. So again, looking very good from the inventory standpoint in the US. Um, looking at crude specifically, if you ignore the products for a second, we have uh, US crude storage with the SPR. So, so US crude has, has two types of storage. There's a commercial storage that's kind of being used on a day-to-day -day basis. There is the SPR, which is the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. You've heard about it on the news uh, with, with Joe Biden talking about it. And, and it's to be used for, for emergencies such as war, hurricanes, kind of that sort of thing. Um, and it, 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 it's been kind of used as a political tool in the last few years. But either way, if you add those two up, um, you have, you know, we're, we're again, we're sitting well below our five-year average. We're sitting well below our, uh, the last five years. And we're, we're actually sitting below our 2010 to 2014 average. When you look at this, so you know demand is up ten percent, and our crude storage is 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 very very low, and you know that that is not a good sign for for somebody where if oil prices do spike on some sort of war or escalation, um, can you pull from the safety net? Well, it doesn't it doesn't really look like it because we're we're sitting below our 20, 2010 to twenty fourteen average already by by about two to 3%, which is pretty significant in, in the oil market. And to add to the, the whole supply crunch, when I talk about US commercial crude inventories, so what we've seen in this last graph, that includes all the, all the oil that's sitting in pipelines that, that kind of, you can't just pull it because it's actively being used. It's actively being pushed in pipelines and, and lines on site or, it's sitting in, in new, new stored tanks that have been added since 2014. So if we look at how much exactly was added, it's roughly uh, 40 to 60 million barrels of additional pipeline fill has been added since 2014. So, okay, if we take the midpoint of that, we take roughly 50 million barrels and we subtract that from this, this, this graph here. I mean, we're down sitting at very, very tight inventories um, from an actual usable oil standpoint. Um, so, you know, if you just look at crude inventories, if you just look at SPR, you might think, you know, we're sitting okay, we'll do fine. 
but a lot of that oil is not usable. You can't you can't just pull uh, oil out of pipelines and run them dry. You you have to have some oil in pipelines. A lot of oil sitting at the bottom of your tanks is basically this heavy sludge that they're counting as as stored oil, but it's not really stored oil. It, it's just it's just sitting there and being counted in the numbers, but it's not usable if you really came down to it and and, and kind of ran the numbers. Um, the SPR itself, again, it's being used as a political tool to lower gasoline prices, uh, to, to have the US administration kind of claim to have control on oil price, which they don't, um, but, but they've kind of drawn down from it over this year, starting in March, April, and we're sitting very low. We're sitting very, very low compared to the, the previous four years. And in the meantime, demand has gone up. So again, the days of cover that you have, it, it's just getting lower and lower and lower as we go. Um, this is that same SPR chart from a, from a 20 year perspective. So you can see we're down to levels that, that we weren't at in like 2002, late 2002 and, and early 03. So, you know, you, you would think that as you keep using more of something, your safety net would get bigger and bigger, right? Like if you, if you had uh, some X amount of food in your, in your cold storage at home, and then you have five kids, well, you, you think that that would go up, but in fact, it's going down. So, you know, you can make your own kind of uh, hypotheses on, on what that means for, for storage going forward. It's, it, it's not looking good. Uh, we look at product storage, gasoline plus distillate plus jet fuel in the US. Again, kind of the same thing. We usually have builds around this time of year just because of the way that the refineries are. There's a seasonal kind of slowdown a bit anyways. So, you know, we are building products, but, but we're again, we're about 10, 10, you know, five to 10% below our 20, um, 2018 to 2021 kind of time frame here. Um, gasoline has built a lot over the last kind of two weeks, two to three weeks because of there's a bunch of slow, slow demand due to Omicron. Um, you know, even if people are not affected by it or they don't care for it, if they do test positive, they still, you know, can't go to work or, or can't do X, Y, Z. So, so there's other issues with that that are affecting gasoline demand, but you know, that seems to be behind us. It's kind of a short term um, issue here. There's been a, lo a lot of snow in the U S Northeast. So people don't really drive that much when there's huge, huge dumps of snow. So a lot of, a lot of factors affecting this and, and it's following the trend over the last few years anyway. Um, and we look at distillate, which is our kind of our diesel fuels, heavier blends, um, you know, again, well below the five-year average and dropping. U.S. jet fuel, you know, U.S. jet fuel, one can say that the demand has not really been back to 2019 levels. And U.S. jet fuel is sitting well below where we need to be for this time of year. So, you know, about about 20 percent down, 15 to 20 percent down our our five-year average. So, what's going to happen if if all of a sudden these intercontinental flights from the U.S. Uh, start up, and there's this huge frenzy of people wanting to get out? Well, you know, you can kind of draw your own conclusion. It's it it's not looking good from an inventory standpoint um, across the U.S. This is one I kind of started tracking about a couple of months ago, propane, um, given that I invested in a couple of producers that were, that were big in the propane market. So we see that American production of propane has kind of gone up, doubled in the last 10 years. But then you look at the number of exports, how much propane are we exporting? It's gone up 11X. So, you know, when, when you increase your production 2X and, and you start exporting 11X, so, the percentage of production that's being exported went from 20% to about 70% in the last 10 years. So that tells me that there's a, there's a global pull on US propane, that there, there's some sort of money-making arbitrage there where companies can, can ship propane from the US Gulf Coast and from their other export terminals to other places around the world and make money on it. So, um, you know, propane demand worldwide is going up crazy. 
it's grown up at a substantial pace and and america is kind of feeding that so there's there's pull on on petroleum and oil and product everywhere and we look at propane inventories again sitting below our five-year average it it's in fact out of the range of the five-year and dropping and the u.s northeast again uses a lot of propane because uh they don't believe in natural gas heating so um they're they're forced to use propane and and heating oils and such which uh are, are obviously not better for the environment but i digress so um if we look at canada inventories um you know you look at this blue line here that's 2021 we were kind of at our five-year top here so there was some talk about okay what's going to happen to the differential in 2022 and then enbridge line three came on we had the trans mountain uh, line come back online we've had some other issues with production at some producers in the oil sands and again it just drops right off a cliff it, it's just straight down and 2022 we started again you know kind of we're we're now in less than six to eight weeks we've we've gone from the five-year range top to almost the five-year range bottom so there's a huge draw on crude no matter where you look it's it's just down uh 22 down in the last month um you know if your storage is down 22 percent in a month that's not really very very good uh from a consumer standpoint so and this is data that that never used to be public and it's and it's kind of coming online now so this is really cool to see because you can kind of predict the uh wcs differential you know at least to some extent of of these kinds of curves saudi inventories so saudi being the world's you know the one of the world's biggest producers um is is sitting at a 20 year low for for oil inventories in fact we've never seen inventories this low before uh, on this graph so look at the draw over the last five years they've pulled roughly 200 million barrels from inventory so you know it's just not sustainable Th this oil that the world was using from inventory over the last few years it's not there anymore and that's why you kind of see that this whole change in some ways people are changing their mindset like saudi themselves are saying look we've underinvested in oil for a long time like we need to get our our act into gear and like and and invest and bring more supply on because we've been kind of subsidizing our production from inventory for a little bit and and we just can't do it anymore so you know when when the largest producer one of the largest producers in the world is saying that i think it's it's better to listen but people don't seem to care so it will uh we'll see where that takes them um this is fujera which is um uae it's one of the big oil hubs in in uae and again you know look at the inventory drop from kind of september 2020 to today it's down roughly 35 percent and and middle distillates are basically gone um you know the heavies are still there etc but the downward trend is the point i'm trying to make it's any any hub you see in the world any country you see in the world is just down and how long can you sustain it this way and you know this is this is with a bunch of production coming online this is with opec adding 400,000 barrels every month and with venezuelan production coming online with some iranian production coming online american production increasing a canadian production increasing so the fact that the additional supply just can't keep up with the demand that's coming in month over month um you know again looking good i don't know how many times i can say it but it's uh it's good this is chinese inventory so what china did was was when covid started they piled up a bunch of oil um in their onshore tanks and you know kind of stayed with that for a while and now they've been drawing down consistently over the last you know six months and it's just a straight line down um sinopec is almost out of out of the extra oil they pulled up and a lot of these refineries are actually in, in a drawdown now from where they were in march 2020 so you know again pulling down worldwide floating inventories um down last last two months has been a consistent trend down china is the one pulling most of it from their floating storage 
So this is oil that's being stored on, on ships on the water. And, you know, instead of buying oil on the spot market at $80 a barrel, China is, is pulling from these inventories. And you can see they've kind of hit a plateau here. You can't just do that forever. So, you know, they, they had to come back on the market and, and it sounds like they are uh, at this point. <clears throat> Jet fuel inventories, again, this is US, Japan and ARA, which is uh, an oil hub in Amsterdam. You know, we're sitting very, very low. Uh, and, and people are just not, you know, not concerned about jet fuel for some reason. But when this huge hub of jet fuel traffic comes online here, as the, as the Omicron kind of fizzles out in the next, you know, couple of weeks to, to four weeks, I mean, this is not looking good for, for jet fuel pricing and, and for airline pricing for people who would like to travel. And, you know, refineries can't just switch on a dime and, all of a sudden start producing a whole bunch of jet fuel. It, it still needs to be processed and then transferred to tanks and then into the airport tanks, you know, et cetera. So there's a bit of a lag there and, and, and no one's ready for it. It's a uh, it's, uh, straight line down. Um, Vietn Vietnamese crude inventories, this is one that I found kind of interesting. So a lot of countries across the world, they don't really share their inventories, but if their oil keeps, keeps selling at a premium, and a higher and higher premium to, to Brent or WTI, you can kind of assume that the supply is just not there and that you know, people are willing to pay more and more for it because there's just not enough of it. So if you look at Vietnamese sweet crude premiums to Brent, they've gone up from like $1.50 in September to about six bucks in, in three months. So what does that tell you? That tells you inventories are very tight, supply is very tight, and uh, you know, again, it's it's not a huge market, it's not a huge producer or anything like that, but but it's just the overall trend that you see that can kind of clue you in as to what's happening on a global scale. Now, there's people on Twitter Spaces and there's people on BNN uh, and the Talking Heads, as we call them, who say, well, you know, this is what's happened so far, but in 2022, inventories are just gonna randomly shoot up all of a sudden. You know, they're going to do a full parabolic curve and, and go back into a, uh, a supply demand, um, uh, like more, more supply than demand all of a sudden, and inventories are going to start building. Well, look at this. They said the same thing in January 2021, and they were flat out completely wrong. They said the same thing in December 2021, and they were flat out completely wrong. And now they're saying the same thing today. And, you know, at, at some point in time in the future, the curve will follow what they say. And, you know, after two or three or four years, they'll claim vi victory after being completely wrong for the last uh, year, at least already. And, you know, it's not that they were wrong by, by a slight margin, like they were completely wrong on the trend line. So, you know, don't, I wouldn't take too much, too much stock from, from these people because, and these estimations and predictions, because they've been wrong. And, and if you look at the trend, there, there would have to be something substantial change on the supply demand to, uh, <clears throat> to kind of affect this, affect this line from going straight down at 45 degrees to then going up all of a sudden. So I'm kind of looking forward to see how this plays out, but yeah, no one so far has been able to explain to me why the curve suddenly shifts from this to this. Um, is there any questions on the inventory side before I go into the demand, demand side of things? Okay. So from a demand standpoint, we have US product. We always focus on the US first because they have the most transparent data. Whether it's accurate and whether you believe it, um, I'll leave it to your own discretion, but, but it's the only transparent source of data we have, so, so we kind of take it. Um, 2022 demand is more than 2019 already and above 2020 and above 2021 and 2018. So, you know, with, with Omicron kind of ravaging across the U.S. right now, a lot of people can't even travel. A lot of people can't go to work. A lot of people working from home. Our products supplied week, week by week it is already beating 2019 levels. So, Anyone talking about demand destruction or talking about 
how oil is on a on a decline and dead. Um, this is your chart right here. So totally false. And and this is expected to continue to keep going up. There's a lot of pent up demand still sitting around where people haven't seen their grandkids. They haven't seen their their parents. They haven't seen their uh, you know nephews and cousins. They've put off weddings. They've put off travel. Uh, you know, travel to Hawaii and and whatever. So a lot of that is still coming out of the woodwork as we go. So, you know, th this is going to be very interesting. And I'm, you know, my opinion is that people are going to be so wrong on the demand side of things. It's going to be uh, pretty hilarious. But uh, I'll wait before I make a a conclusion on that on that part of uh, the spectrum quite yet. Uh, weekly U.S. gasoline demand is down, as I kind of discussed before. Uh, this, this graph is not a scale from like zero to 10. It's it's from 8.5 or something to, to 9.5. So it's not a huge drop. Uh, but again, most of this is due to uh, with people catching such a transmissible virus, there's always going to be a slowdown. Um, and then also with the, with the snow in the big population centers of, of Chicago, Boston, New York, uh, kind of the big travel hubs, um, you know, it's, it's, it, it's expected. And if you look at the U.S. total vehicle miles driven, there's always a slowdown in January to February, you know, because people have have had their Christmas time. They've seen each other. They've spent money and they just have this like little lull in demand. And then and in March, it picks up substantially. So, again, watching for this, you know, make sure the curve is kind of following this as we go. Um, global flight demand. So we're not quite at our 2019 levels yet on, on the flight demand. We're, we're still a bit below, but we're, we're going up. We're above 2021 levels by, by fair amount and kind of, you know, poised to continue higher and, and reach these 2019 levels and maybe go higher than that. So as you see here, 2020 demand, um, number of flights worldwide was, was pretty significantly more than 2019. So, so this is growing. It's not... It's not that we need to reach 2019 levels. We're going to by far overtake 2019 levels, maybe all the way up to here. So again, something that the world just does not care about. They, they think jet fuel is dead and people don't want to travel anymore. Well, yeah, there, there's going to be a brick wall coming, um, a, a little realization coming for that as we go into the, the summer season here. So we look at China flight demand. Um, 2022 so far, it, it's been lower. It's, it's been up and down with their absolutely, you, you cannot predict what they're going to do with their zero COVID policy. They've got the Olympics coming up. So what's going to happen to this? We, we don't really know, but it's, it's holding steady. Um, and, and one thing I'll mention is that if you look at 2020, there's kind of a big, big change there, but that's because of international fl flights. So Flights within China domestically are actually above 2019 levels already, but it's this huge drop off in international traffic to China that's kind of having this big, big change here. And if China decides to open up their, their borders to international traffic again, I mean, there is about, you know, if we take the difference here, it's about 10,000 flights a day that's, that's going to add just by China changing their one policy on people coming into the into the country. So again, jet fuel demand has upside risk. It's there's a minimum level of jet fuel that's just required to, to run the world economy, whether it's cargo, whether it's military. Uh, I think 50% of the of the US military spending is on jet fuel. So um, you know the regular domestic flights they have to keep going. And the upside risk to to jet fuel demand is all to the upside. It's only got upwards to go. Um, so for anyone worried about, about impacts of, of the virus on, on jet fuel demand, it's not gonna impact it very much because it's already at such a low um, number. Um, there's some questions that are, that are not, not related to this. So, so I'll come back to them uh, before I begin my, my company valuation kind of a standpoint, but, but feel free to type questions in or interrupt me anytime if you have any questions on the, on the whole macro side of things uh, so far. Um, India flight demand has gone down because they've implemented a new policy 
that requires a seven day quarantine when you enter the country, um, which has had a significant impact so far. But, you know, where does that go? Well, uh, you know, the, the Omicron in India seems to have peaked or is peaking. So we see this curve kind of come back to its, to its regular um, trend line over the next month or so. Uh, we look at Australia and Canada are pretty flat. Again, some very restrictive policies in these two countries, and we haven't really seen seen number of flights drop off. Um, you know that there's a seasonal drawdown anyway, as you kind of follow these other lines. Um, Japan and Malaysia, you know, we have a long ways to go to to 2019 levels. So that's the upside risk I'm talking about. That this is the base level of flights required to just keep the country running, and then we have all this upside yet to come. Um, on that. Uh, South Africa, Indonesia, big, big travel centers, um, you know, Indonesia, especially once they open up the country and, and the backpackers and the, and the spring breakers and the travelers, you know, start heading there. Those are big jet fuel usage flights from Europe all the way to Indonesia, from, from America all the way to Indonesia, from Australia. You know, these are long haul flights that, that are going to add a lot of jet fuel usage in a very short period of time. Um, we look at Germany and UK, again, very restrictive policies with, with this virus, but they seem to be opening up now. So again, this trend will now continue back on its upwards uh, slope here. We see the UK kind of flatlining, which is the minimum level of flights required to keep the country going. Um, and then we look at Mexico and, and the Dominican, we're above 2019 levels. People, people want to travel and as the world kind of opens up, as people learn to live, live with COVID more and more, um, you know, I can't see why this would go down. It would, it would, in fact, start going up and up and up as people want to kind of get away from the same place they've been stuck in for the last, uh, last two years. Uh, Colombia, same thing, well above 2019 levels. Uh, Turks and Caicos, you know, it's not a huge number of flights, but well above 2019 levels. So. The big travel destinations that are open are getting a lot of traffic. And when the other travel destinations open around the world, they're gonna see the same kind of uh, uh, traffic come back. Um, more on the India demand side on, on gasoline, uh, cons consistently going up, even with the, with the drawdown in 2020, with, with the slowdown in the country, we're now reaching new highs every month and it just continues to keep going up. Um, the crude throughput in India, they're building a lot of refineries. They have roughly, I think, 40 refineries under construction that are going to be online by 2025. So, so that they're, they're using up more and more crude. They're kind of pre-preparing for the demand, um, that that's yet to come in the next few years. So again, a big source of demand that the world is not really taking into account. There's a lot of demand here that that they think is just gonna continue at this low pace when in reality it's, uh, I'll explain later here, but it's, it's gonna keep going up at a, at a much higher pace than people think. Um, and this is why. So from 2009 to 2014, India built roughly 5,000 kilometers of roads a year. Uh, 2014 to 21, they were at 9,000 kilometers of road every year of, of highways. Um, 2020, and 2021, they targeted 11,000, and they actually did 13,000. So they're going crazy with, with the road construction, and people don't construct roads just for them to be left empty and, and nothing happened to them. So, um, you know, that's, that's a sign that should tell you early on that, hey, there's something going on here that, that maybe the, the market and the analysts are not seeing, you know, if you just look at global or Indian demand numbers, you may not see this, this whole inflection point where they've gone from building, you know, 5,000 to 9,000 to now 13,000 kilometers of road every year. Um, it kind of foreshadows, it gives you a warning sign as to what's coming. If you can find this kind of data and, and, and analyze it like this, uh, you look at the vehicle sales in India, uh, they've gone from two million to five to nine. Uh, you know, even in the in the COVID year, they kind of beat their previous high watermark um, on that. And this year is going to be even even bigger. Like this, 
uh, or sorry, 870,000 number is just for April to November. So six months of the year, they've hit 870,000 while well, they're gonna destroy all these previous numbers, um, you know, in terms of vehicle sales. Modernization in India, we've gone from 50 airports in 2000 to 100 in 2018. And in the next 10 years, we're gonna go add another 150 airports. Um, again, if you look at data like this, the rate of change has gone from this, from this linear phase to this exponential phase. And you know, if you see this coming, you can see that oil demand is just gonna to continue to increase um, at a very, very rapid pace. Um, the number of users with, with internet in India has gone from roughly 18% five years ago to now 50%. Um, so, so what happens when people start using the internet? They, they look at travel blogs, they look at vehicle ads, they look at um, uh, flight tickets. They look at the Western culture with their with their uh, vehicles and their barbecues and their and their refrigerators and 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 stoves and such. So, you know, the more people that are on there, the more people see what they want that they didn't know before. So, a huge source of demand that's uh, that's that's yet to come and. For anyone talking about peak oil demand, I would I would love for you to show me any data, um, you know that that shows that we've hit peak oil demand because uh, it's definitely not the case from what I see. Um, Chinese oil demand. So there was a huge concern around September October time that China had stopped buying crude on the spot market. Is the economy going into the dump? Uh, but they're back, right? They were just playing games here because they didn't want to pay high high prices for oil, and they started using floating storage, they started using crude from their tanks, and now they're back in the market. Um, you know, September, October, you can see they were pulling oil from commercial reserves from the SPR, and you can't just do that forever. So they're back in the market. We've seen a 20% change here, uh, year over year. And uh, they're back into, um, you know, into the 11 million barrel a day of, of, of imports. So yeah, you can play games for a month or two months and, and pull from inventory. But when, you, when your inventories themselves are getting strained, well, then you have to come back to the market in a big way, which we see. Um, Chinese electricity consumption, straight line up, no stopping, no impact from COVID. And uh, we see that here on the right as well. Um, you know, there's, there's really no impact. The US and Europe have kind of flatlined, but um, these two, these two areas here that are flatlined are roughly 1, 1. 1.2 billion people. And China, India, and Africa here is roughly 5 billion, 4 billion people um, combined. So the big population centers, the big emerging markets are uh, straight up. And they're going to keep going straight up. And India and Africa, which have been flat for a while, are going to now go into this, this uh, change of curve where they go from a linear phase to an exponential phase. And uh, yeah, energy is going to be very, very high demand for, for a long, long time to come. Any questions so far? Anyone want to chime in or, or share anything? I'll just continue rambling on. Okay. Um, so this is the US oil consumption. Um, even for being such a first world country, this keeps going up such a, um, you know, it's not an emerging market by any means, but keeps going up. China, up. India, up. There's there's no stopping the the emerging markets, or the developed markets, from this. Um, world oil products demand again, up. Everything's up and to the right. There's no there's nothing that shows oil demand peaking. Uh, there's no data at all that shows that. Um, we see global oil demand is is projected 2022 over 4 million barrels a day from 21. Um, a lot of that is coming from China, um, India, and Southeast Asia. You know, I'm a little bit from South Korea. So, so Asian demand is, is kind of one of the big, uh, big factors. Um, and this is a very, very interesting graph that I found, which was when, when China went from its linear oil, oil demand phase to this, to this step change and inflection point, 
this was kind of where their oil usage was at and their population was was x that's kind of where india is at right now they've reached this point of kind of peak saturation and their population is roughly 6% larger than china and you can almost see that in the graph where this green line is has been on the same trend as china for the last few years and then now it's going up on this on this inflection point even with um actually this is before the effects of covid but you know it's it's had a step change and a lot of analysts i don't think have taken this into account they they keep thinking india is going to continue at their same growth per year in terms of oil demand when that's that's really not going to be the case um we look at this is a hilarious graph and and whoever made this should get props um so one one refrigerator in america uses 459 kilowatt hours of electricity a year and there's 500 million people in these six countries that use less electricity than that in a year than one american refrigerator um and and you know four of these countries are by far below that so what's going to happen when these people they don't just want refrigerators they want motorcycles they want uh barbecues they want um uh tv and you know all all the luxuries of life well what's going to happen and you know a lot of people in america don't just have one refrigerator they got three and then they got a deep freeze to go with it with it so um yeah i mean if if you just extrapolate this in your mind to to what's going to happen when these 500 million people which is which is more than the us um kind of just want a little bit more of the luxuries of life um and then and then anyone who can look at this graph and and tell me about peak oil demand and and peak energy um is just crazy um so you know for all the greenwashing and all the other other garbage uh, stats thrown out there i mean the data shows something completely different the trend shows something completely different and um yeah that's just my opinion anyways um the human development index so this tracks kind of the quality of life versus the energy used per person um it kind of goes flat again i come back to the same point it goes flat up to a point and then it switches to this exponential curve and the reason for that is because you go from from stuff that uses no no energy like like a uh, walking and bicycles and you go to motorcycles and you go from reading newspapers to watching tv so there's you go from using zero energy to using x amount of energy and all these people in this box which is 5.5 billion people want what this usa has and they're watching tv and it shows what the usa has so they want that and that's basically the end of it and this little box here which is the people that are pretty close to to being on this inflection point that's 4.5 billion people so of this entire rectangle of 5.5 billion people 4.5 of them are basically on the cusp of this step change in in energy usage um so you know from again there is no peak oil demand yet and 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 there is no peak energy usage yet unless you have a catastrophic recession which which wipes out the world or some kind of nuclear war um i just don't see any other any other way you can you can even predict peak oil demand like it it just does not make sense um energy and population outlook so i don't like people who predict stuff to 2100 like 80 years down the road but the point is population is going to keep going up and energy usage per capita is going to keep going up i think that part is obvious um this one here so this is america from 1950 to 2017 the population went up one times number of households went up uh 3x uh number of drivers went up 3.5x vehicles went up 6x and the and the miles traveled went up 7x so this 70 year trajectory that america had is not going to happen in in 10 to 15 years in india and vietnam and bangladesh and indonesia or not indonesia and uh, uh thailand and such so over the next 15 to 20 years because vehicles in the 1950s were not so common today they are very common 
So this number of vehicles going up 6x is going to happen in a very short time frame. And uh, they're not going to be EVs because uh, people don't really want EVs in these countries. They can't afford EVs. And uh, there's other problems which I'll address with, with EVs. But this is going to be mostly fuel, fuel com uh, combustion vehicles. And um, so number of SUVs in key markets. So, you know, 10 years ago, we had SUV sales, roughly 15% of the global uh, vehicle sales. Now we're up to 45%. So anyone talking about, about ESG and wanting to save, save miles per gallon um, is, is talking the talk, but not walking the walk. So people want bigger vehicles. People want trucks. And guess what happens when, when you, if you're driving a sedan and 45% of vehicles on the road are SUVs and trucks, you're going to want a truck because you don't, you know, you got your kid in the backseat. Do you really feel safe anymore when, when the majority of vehicles were sedans maybe, but now that there's b these big hunks of metal driving around, um, it's kind of like a snowball effect. And, and you see that there hasn't been a single year where the number of SUV sales as a percentage of global sales has gone down. So, um, you know, it's just going to keep going up. Um, peak coal demand. We never hit peak coal demand. There was a little point here where, where people started talking about the, the death of coal and, and how it's on its way out. And despite all the efforts of, of, of Canada and the US and Europe in, in taking coal out, we seem to be back to where we were uh, and a new peak potentially forming with, uh, with China firing up a whole ton of coal, coal, uh, coal energy, energy consumption. So if we haven't even hit peak coal yet, which is by far the dirtiest fuel you can say, and probably the most polluting and worse for the health of the people living around it, if, if you can't even get coal out of the way, how can you predict peak oil demand? Um, we'll talk about Norway because people keep bringing up Norway as being the leader in, in electric vehicles and, and they're doing all this from, from hydropower and such. So this is Norway P, uh, Norway oil oil consumption per year. So from two, 2009 to about 2020, which is kind of a, a, that's not the right year to compare to. So, so 2009 to 2019, their oil demand fell by 4% in that period. And look at the sales of vehicles. They've gone from 75% diesel to now, if you add up the electric and the plug-in hybrid and the non-plug hybrid, that's 92% of their, of their sales was was EVs or, or part way to becoming EVs and the oil demand doesn't seem to have been impacted. So, you know, when your buddy out there is telling you that that EVs are gonna destroy oil and, and you know, you're stupid for believing that oil is gonna be there uh, because EV sales are, are through the roof, you know, take a screenshot of this slide and, uh, and show it to them because uh, that's just not the case. And, and gasoline demand for, for personal use is a very small part of worldwide oil demand. Um, there, th there's many other things that use oil. And uh, you know, if you can have 92% sales of, of electric and hybrid and not make a dent in your oil demand, um, something is seriously wrong with, with these projections and predictions that people are throwing out there. Um, Alberta natural gas demand. So, so a little bit more on the gas side uh, keeps going up. You know, 2022 was our highest year yet. US domestic gas demand keeps going up. Um, it's not stopping. Um, Western Canadian storage is at pretty low, low inventories on the gas side. Um, the US is in pretty good shape. I don't talk much about gas because it's, it's, it's just not my, my investment style. I like the oil market. It, it's so much more transparent. Um, you know, you can, you can substitute gas with, with other sources of, of energy, but you cannot substitute oil. So, so the oil market is just much easier to, to kind of project and see the trends and kind of see what's going on. Um, are there any questions on the demand side before I go into supply? Anyone want to chime in with, with anything? I know there's a few questions here, but, but they're not related to the macro. So maybe I'll, uh, I'll, uh, maybe I'll leave it here. And for uh, for later, um, 
there's a question on the on the geopolitical risks and such, but uh, I'll talk about that later as well. Um, okay, no other questions. Cool. Everyone can hear me fine. Hey, on the on the Zoom call, there's no issues with the audio. Loud and clear. Cool. Perfect. Okay, so um, when I first started this seminar, people were were telling me about uh, about uh, my my seminar that I keep talking about demand, and you know, demand is only one side of the equation, and supply is the other side. And you know, OPEC and US is just going to fire up the taps and uh, your whole demand is gonna get taken care of. So, you know, what, why are you worried? So I decided to do some work on the, on the, uh, decided to do some work on the supply side, a little bit more, get myself familiar with things. So this is US crude oil production versus rig counts. Um, and it hasn't really fired up. We were still well below our 2019 peak in oil production and in the rig counts. And, you know, we've been in an $80 oil environment for four months now. Um, October oil price was roughly $82 WTI. November was 79 average. So, so what's going on? Um, why isn't America drilling? Well, you know, it, it's because they can't. And they, there's a lot of problems here, which I'll go through here over the next next few slides. Uh, but basically, the, pr the production has not ramped up how you would expect in an 80 plus dollar WTI environment. The rig count is still substantially lower than what it was in, in early 2019. And one of the interesting things to notice from this graph is that with the rig count at roughly 750, I believe, US oil production growth had stalled already at this point in time. And now we only have, you know, 550 rigs going and we're seeing growth. So, so what's, the, what's the disconnect? How come they're able to grow at a lower amount of rigs than they, than they got stalled out at before? Well, it all has to do, um, actually, I'll begin with the rig count over the last month has been completely flat. So you're seeing no supply response from the American producers. And I'll kind of talk about that as I go as well, but you know, when I first put this graph out, I, I put it out roughly on the 7th of January or something. And, and I got this nasty message talking about, well, you're, you're manipulating the data by, by taking advantage of the fact that, that rigs slow down in the Christmas time. Well, you know, whoever that was, here, here's your one month. Uh, it's now been three, four weeks after Christmas and we still don't see the response. So, um, so why is that? The big reason is that we all, America always used to drill and complete at a roughly one-to-one -one ratio over time. Uh, there's been kind of changes in that, you know, with, with, with short-term blips and such, but it's been relatively the case. But for the last 18 months, we've completed a lot more wells than we've drilled. So when you have a well, you got to drill it, and then you have to hydraulically fracture it, as in completing it to get it onto production. And so how come, how come producers are completing way more wells? Well, it's because of the DUCs. So a DUC is a drilled, uncompleted well. So a lot of companies will drill wells and then they'll leave them. They won't complete them until they're ready to put them on production. So this count had kind of ballooned up by, by COVID time to roughly 9,000 wells. And now what companies are doing is, is, is instead of drilling wells and then completing them, they're just completing these wells that are already drilled. And why is that? Because it costs money to drill wells. So if they can kind of not have to put that money in and just complete wells, they'll do that for now. Um, and they also don't have to spend money on, on, on casing. They don't have to spend money on a lot of the, the well heads and the drilling, um, getting the surface lease done, getting the permits, et cetera. So they're taking advantage of this and the DUCs are running low. We're down to roughly levels last seen in 2014. And a lot of these wells are duds. So, so more than half of them will never be completed because they are uneconomic. They drilled into a water zone. They screwed up the drilling and, and they messed up the well. 
Um, they have some sort of inter interference with, with other wells. So half of them will never be completed. And there's about a thousand of them that are being worked on with the rigs currently working. So a lot of these DUCs are on the same pad as where the rig is drilling. So you, you can't have a rig drilling and then complete on the same pad. So a lot of them are kind of like DUCs in progress. So if you take those two chunks out of this, you're basically left with maybe three months of, of DUCs, maybe two, maybe one, um, you know, that, that they can pull from. And then you're gonna have this huge problem uh, where, where companies will have to fire up rigs or the production will, will start declining again. There's no other way um, really around it. So the same graph here, you know, you, you can kind of see that it's been a consistent drawdown in the, in the DUC wells. Um, and you know, how, how far can you take it? If half of these, this last uh, bar are duds and another thousand of them are being worked on already with the rigs, the rigs that are drilling, you're running on fumes. It's it's getting pretty close to uh, D Day here for these uh, for these rigs. Um, this is work that that a guy from Twitter did, Tom uh, Tom Luffrey, uh, amazing guy, like very insightful. Uh, you know XTO, which is also Exxon Mobil, is basically out of out of workable DUCs. Chevron, same thing. PXD, one of the biggest uh, producers. Uh, in the Permian, almost nothing. Uh, Fang, Diamondback, another huge producer, almost nothing. So, so they're they're running on fumes, and and the data kind of shows that it, it's not just me making up claims. Um, you know, this one kind of shows you here that this this gray bar, this gray portion is kind of the the wells that are being worked on actively already. You know, so they're not just DUCs that you can go put a frack fleet on and frack. They're, they're wells that are being worked on already with the rigs uh, that are currently drilling. So, you know, you have maybe two months of supply here left. Uh, when does it come to fruition? My estimate is March 1st, but um, that's just my opinion. So, um, you know, if, if the rigs haven't picked up sub substantially by March 1st, I would be looking for U.S. production to decline from then, and most of the most of the people expect a one million barrels a day increase in U.S. production in 2022. Um, if the rigs don't climb by March 1st, that is nowhere close to what's going to happen. Uh, you might actually see a decline um, in U.S. production. So why are they not firing up rigs? Well, look at the public companies, the majors. The large caps and the small to mid caps are flat. They they're happy raking in the money at eighty dollar oil and paying back debt, giving dividends, uh, buying back shares. They're not really interested in growth. It's the private companies that have that have jacked up rigs and are sitting above twenty nineteen levels. So why is that? Because a lot of them are basically dead money. Four hundred companies, private companies in the U.S. are dead money, and they want to put lipstick on a pig by, by jacking up production, making themselves look pretty, and then hopefully one of these majors is going to bite and, and buy them out. Um, if you follow the M&A in the U.S. over the last kind of 12 months, there hasn't been much M&A. <laughs> these major companies and the, and the public companies know that these private companies, a lot of it is just garbage um, that they've kind of fired up to make look good for a sale. So, you know, why would they go and, and buy them out? They'll just wait for them to go bankrupt or, or sell at pennies on the dollar and then pick them up then. So the M&A has really not been there in the Permian or the Eagleford or the, or the Balkan um, because the companies know what's going on. They're not stupid. So, you know, how, how many more rigs are the privates willing to add and, and, and keep pumping away at this story? Um, we'll find out, but I don't think it's, it's very many more. And you see that from the banking side, the banks really supported private equity uh, upstream oil companies in 2014, 15, 16, 17. They were pumping out a new private company like once every three days, a new company with two, three, four, six hundred million dollars, you know, ready to drill and frack. Well, look at 2020. It's less than one a month is what they're supporting. The banks, 
the banks are kind of losing money and being shown these, these fancy corporate presentations of, of XYZ, a company making billions of dollars, and then it goes bankrupt in two years. So, um, you know, the banks, the banks kind of know what's going on. Investors know what's going on. And, uh, you know, I think the general public doesn't. They, they still think that American shale can just fire up another, you know, 1 million or 2 million barrels a day next year or this year. Um, I think they're in for a shock. Okay, American supply from a overall standpoint. So America became a net exporter of oil in, in early 2020. They started exporting more oil than they were importing. Um, you know, about, about 2 million barrels a day, 1.5 million a day. And look at where we are now. We're back to importing, being a net importer of 1.5 billion barrels a day. So what does that mean? That means that on a global supply scale, the U.S. has gone from exporting 1.5 million barrels a day to importing 1.5, which means they're pulling 3 million barrels a day that was previously accessible to the world for their uses is now being consumed inside America. So 3 million barrels a day is a huge change in the supply demand uh, perspective. And that's partly why you're seeing a lot of other countries kind of struggling now to source cargoes. Um, they, they don't have the uh, easy availability of crude coming out of America. Now, now America is fighting for these same barrels to be imported. Um, so, you know, you see this, this change in trend where America was exporting more and more and more oil. And now this trend has changed the other way. And it's not really flatlining either. It keeps going up. So, you know, what, what does that tell you? That tells you the world is in a is in a supply demand issue here is going on. And, you know, if you can get, catch these trends as they change, you know, this is kind of when a lot of people would have started investing in oil, maybe would have done the best kind of early, you know, mid, mid to late 2020 is kind of when this trend changes. And it's just been consistently on this uh, upwards curve since then. Um, and most people know this already. Uh, the the oil companies are not investing back in the ground. Their their reinvestment rate has gone from 180 percent to to down to 40, 50 percent uh, from 2014 to 2020. Um, they're just not interested in in the whole drill baby drill thing anymore. They want they want to pay back debt. They wanna they want to give out dividends, um, etc. And you look at that worldwide. It's the same trend. Um, you know, if companies are gonna are gonna provide a higher quality of life for for their people, and then they get absolutely railed on TV and from the news people and from their own people that they're polluting the environment and they're killing people, you know, why would they do it anymore? They just said, okay, well, you know, you can't have your cake and eat it too, so we'll we'll stop investing and you guys do your thing. So, you know, the projections all the way to 2025 show that we're we, we're not even close to the rates required to keep oil production um you know stable um okay so we go into us so let's talk about conventional production a lot of production growth over the last few years has been unconventional hydraulically fractured but there's still these these conventional production out there these old vertical wells that keep drilling away but the problem with conventional production is it all follows the same path, the Hubbard linear, linearization. Once you produce half your recoverable reserves, your production goes into terminal decline. It's a fact. So, you know, this is American conventional production, which was all the way up to 9 million barrels a day at one point. And then they produced half the reserves, recoverable reserves. And uh, it's been on a downhill slope since then. What they've done over the last few years has been stem the decline using water floods, um, infill drilling, EOR, EOR techniques, uh, IOR techniques and such. You know, so once you decline from the peak by third, uh, 50 to 60 percent, you can kind of stem the last few years and kind of drag them out. But the terminal decline cannot be stopped. It, it just keeps going down. So. You know, that's U.S. conventional. Is it going to come back to the same extent? No way. 
Um, they might be able to stem the decline and kind of add a few barrels here and there, but it's basically on its way out. Um, let's talk about Gawar, which is the world's biggest oil field. At its peak, it was producing roughly, you know, five, more than five million barrels a day. Um, one of the biggest sources of, of oil in the world, 50% of Saudi Arabia's production. Um, you know, an absolutely amazing oil field, probably the best the world will ever see. And um, you know, it it hit hit its peak in roughly the 1970s. Because it's such a historic field, it's been able to stay at that peak for a longer time. Um, but r right about where this graph ends in about 2004, 2005, a book came out by, by Matt Simmons, uh, Twilight in the Desert, absolutely amazing read, uh, talking about the, the death of Gawar. And, you know, people kind of had, had both opinions on it, but, um, we saw that at this point, Gawar was at half its recoverable reserves and this decline was on. So the latest information we have from this field and, and Saudi is not very transparent on their data, but in 2019, when they, when they IPO'd Saudi Aramco, they said Gawar was producing 3.8 million barrels a day. So if we, if we pick 2019 here, we go up the curve and we kind of um, you know, bring it here, it's roughly 3.8, maybe a little bit lower. And the most recent projection was, was 3.2. So 2022, let's go, let's take it up the curve, you know, roughly 3.2, maybe a little bit lower. So Gawar is on this terminal decline. It's no longer sustaining the world's growth at this, at this same uh, level that it has for the last few years, for the last, you know, from seventies to 2000. So, supply is going down in conventional fields across the world. And conventional production is roughly 60% of the world's oil production. So if it's, if it's in all in terminal decline, what does that tell you? It's, it's not only not staying flatlined, it's not only not growing, it's in a terminal decline phase. So, you know, okay, what about Saudi's other fields? Well, you take all their fields, they all peaked, in the 1970s or the 1980s. So they're all on the same terminal decline. We look at Kuwait uh, with their Bergan field, missing every single target for the last few years and declining roughly 10%. Um, with the latest projection here on the right, 2021, it's down another 10% from 2.8 million barrels to, to 2.4. So OPEC can't turn on the taps either. And American shale can't turn on the taps either. So there's a big difference in opinion between the general market and, and what the data is telling me. So that, that difference in supply is probably the biggest reason why I'm invested in the oil companies, why 95% of my portfolio is in upstream oil ENPs, is because the difference in opinion is so large that you could see a historic Oil, oil price uh, environment. And it's, it's maybe one of the reasons why people are talking about $200 oil, $300 oil. It's, you know, we see it with European gas. It just does not stop. Like when, when the oil barrel can't be found, it just keeps getting bid up and up and up. And there's no logical reason, you know, reasoning to it maybe, but we've seen it in the last year, crude went to negative 37 and gas went to thousand dollars a megawatt hour and European gas is, is just going crazy. So, you know, as much as I don't want to sit here and shout about a thousand dollar oil or anything like that, um, it's a distinct possibility given that 60% of the world is in this terminal decline phase. Um, we look at Saudi Arabian rigs on the left here. So 2005, um, Matt Simmons book came out. They did a bunch of engineering work. Um, they kind of Brought production uh, online with with infill drilling, CO2 projects, uh, water floods, etc. And now they're down for the last two years. They haven't really drilled much, so they're back in this kind of you know decline phase. Uh, we look at international rig counts, kind of the same thing. They have not picked up to what we need to keep this production uh, stable, or not declining more 
then even the Hubbard linear linearization shows. Uh, we look at Russia. Yeah, Russia is adding production, but you know this is 2022 right here. They're adding roughly 100 to 150 thousand barrels a year, which is if you take the 60 million barrels of conventional production across across the world, and you put a five percent decline rate on it, you know, which is pretty very conservative. That's that's three million barrels a day we need to replace just to keep world oil production stable. Not even to account for the additional growth and the demand that I've talked about for the last uh, the last few slides before this. So Russia's adding 150, nothing crazy. Uh, the North Sea, which has been one of the biggest contributors to to growth and kind of supported oil supply for the past few years. Brent Brent pricing comes from the North Sea. Um, terminal decline, you know, and and this is their own forecast. This is from S and P plots. Uh, Norway had some fields that came on online in 2020. Um, the Johan, the Johan Sverdrup field came online. <clears throat> so there's not much left in the pipeline to come online. It's all, it's all downhill from here. Uh, we look at Mexico. This is Cantarell field in Mexico. You know, it produced for a while. They tried to overproduce it, and it was kind of already on its decline phase. And and look how fast it died. It went from over 2 million barrels a day to roughly 500,000 in 10 years. So a 75% decline in its production in 10 years. Um, you know, there, there's other issues that happen at Cantarell, but, but the, the point being made is once you decline, it declines. Um, this is conventional oil across the world, uh, all all on a decline. Australia, the UK, Ecuador, Colombia, Argentina, um, Malaysia, Egypt, some of these fields don't even exist anymore because they've basically declined beyond their, their economics. Um, you know, they've all hit their peak in about 2003. Conventional oil production did peak in 2000 or 2003, and it's just down. And all production we need to replace. Um, we look at Brazil. One of the big growth areas for oil production in the world. So, you know, Brazil gave out a bunch of land blocks. Companies came in. This is the Brazil rig count. Um, companies came in and started drilling more and more. And these projects started coming online in about 2013 because it takes a while to, to explore offshore, get the FID, and then drill and put it on production. So, all these projects coming online over the last seven years. Have been those that were drilled in this this high rig count time. Well, look at where the rig count is now. You know, it's there's no projects going to be coming online because the rig count has just not been there to to sustain this kind of growth um, trajectory. You know, a lot of oil that Brazil is is adding. Um, sorry, a lot of oil. A lot of oil that Brazil is adding is, is from this money that was spent during this time. And now they haven't spent any money. So, so expect this to kind of not be the same, the same growth coming out of Brazil. Uh, West Africa, so Nigeria, Angola, kind of the biggest producers there, uh, Congo, uh, on its way down. So, you know, even from the January 2020 forecast that, that, that Rystad put out, we have 600,000 barrels a day of undersupply from a forecast that was done only two years ago. And by 2026, there's a 650,000 barrel a day undersupply on that. So this curve was already down and now there's, a, there's another huge gap on the curve. So they can't even meet their own declining targets. Um, you know, not looking good. Um, USA supply. So let me talk a little bit more about the Permian. Uh, so the Permian well productivity peaked in 2018, 2019 was kind of the peak, these, these orange lines. Um, since then, it's kind of on its way down. So anyone talking about, about rig efficiencies and well productivities, um, they always give you data that's not normalized. So they don't, they don't adjust for the fact that they're drilling longer and longer wells and they're jamming more and more propent in these wells. So once you normalize for that fact, Product, rig productivity and well productivity has been going down since 2018, 2019. And in fact, since 2016 and 17, like the, the longer end of the curve 
these wells have a higher peak because they're jamming more and more sand in them and then they decline faster. So, so they end up producing less oil um, at the end of it all. And here's your Permian production graph. So incredible growth, um, absolutely amazing what the Permian has done and props to their producers for, for being able to, to do this. But look at the declines. 60% of the oil that was producing on January 1st, 2020 is now gone. It's, it's declined that much in just two years. So it's, it's a treadmill. You have to keep adding humongous amounts of capital and resources and, and, and drilling rigs and fracks and, you know, et cetera, just to keep production flat. And, and we kind of see the Permian is running into a problem now where, you know, they, they aren't able to maintain these, these growth rates because of the issues I mentioned with, uh, with the well productivity not being that good, with uh, um, rigs not being available, private equity money not being available, the bank's not interested. Um, you know, let's talk about the Eagleford. There's two companies with good rock in the Eagleford. That's, that's Conoco and Marathon. The rest is all, you know, if, if you look at it, it, the productivity change is so dramatic that when these four companies are talking about drilling Eagleford wells, like they're not going to be good wells. They're just drilling, you know, kind of the, the tier two, tier three, tier four stuff. Um, you know, it's, it's just not good rock. And for, for all the talk about EOG talking about their triple premium inventory and whatnot, uh, it's not triple premium um, as is pretty obvious here. Um, the number of well permits across the three big basins has not come back to 2019 levels, even in an $80 oil environment. So it's not just rigs that are the problem, it's the companies themselves are not getting permits to drill these wells. They're just not interested anymore. They just wanna maintain their production and, and, and give money out, pay back debt. Um, there's just no appetite for it. Um, okay. So I'll talk to the Canadian supply here in a sec. Um, Permian Basin, so this is water disposal in the Permian Basin. So when you have shale, shale wells, they produce about four barrels, three to four barrels of water for every barrel of oil. And it's becoming a huge problem. They're, they're disposing roughly 15 million barrels of water a day is what they have to dispose. And, and you can't just jam it into the ocean or into some lake. You have to dispose it deep underground or recycle it. Um, so it's becoming a more and more problem. Uh, the water production is increasing, as you see here, per year. The water oil ratios are increasing. So more and more water is being produced for every barrel of oil as we go. So there's more water needing to be disposed. Um, so why is that a problem? Because of, of uh, earthquakes. So the number of earthquakes in the, in the uh, Permian Basin has basically gone up substantially here um you know because you're jamming more and more water into these formations with uh, natural fractures uh, and you're crushing up these zones and and you have seismic activity i mean it's it's uh it just makes sense so you know look at the trajectory of this curve the cumulative earthquakes more than a magnitude three and we look at it from another way um the, the, number of, the number of earthquakes more than three and 3.5 is increasing at a very rapid pace. Um, you know, not a good sign. There's been some earthquakes more than four here. Uh, Midland had one uh, just before Christmas. So there's going to be a pretty heavy handed response from this at some point, um, whether it's this month or this year, we don't know, but you can't just continue on the same path. Um, the, the Oklahoma Commission had to step in very aggressively and basically shut down a lot of production in that area. So, so the Permian has problems from, from a variety of, of, uh, of standpoints. Um, there's a question here on Canadian oil sands, uh, on Canadian oil sands supply response and six month projection. So the Canadian oil sands has already increased their production to the max really that they can. If you look at in situ and mining production, it's up over the last six months because of this new line three coming online, um, a little more capacity on the, on the Trans Mountain and such. Um, 
and they're basically jamming their production as, as much as they can. There is no appetite to increase Canadian oil sands production. There, there's no one putting in long lead projects. There's no one doing um, any FIDs on any big mines or, bi or big production ads. Um, so if you ask me how much can Canadian oil add in the next six months, maybe 100,000 barrels a day, you know, if I was to guess, but, but it's, not, it's not anything that's substantial from a, from a global a supply standpoint. Um, okay, so the other big sh um, shale, I guess, in the, in the US is the Bakken. So this is what the Bakken looks like. So this is roughly, I think 500 square miles. Um, yeah, I wanna say, no, 5,000 square miles, I believe uh, here. And, you know, can anyone, can anyone see where you're going to drill next? It's uh, it's pretty damn crowded in here, uh, you know, in my opinion. So they basically drilled the best of the best already in the Bakken. And, you know, we look at this this data that's come out. Um, almost 70% of the sites left are in the bottom quartile or, or the bottom quintile, the bottom 20% of, of wells. And you know, you could say 85, 90% of the wells left are in the bottom 40%. So, you know, anyone talking about rig efficiencies in the Bakken or talking about having tier one in the Bakken for the next 20 years um, is lying. So there's really no better way to put it. Uh, and I've got a lot of pushback on this. And then, you know, I, I think there, there's other factors at play where, yeah, people are drilling very, very good wells, but that's because they're exploiting areas like this one area here, for example, or their 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 laterals are longer and they're they're drilling with more propent or or whatever. So you know you, you can't just compare a well from 2014 to 2021 without normalizing for these things. Um, this is the Bakken gas oil ratio. So when you have a oil reservoir and you keep pulling oil out, you keep depressurizing it what happens is that the gas starts to come out of the oil because when you have lower pressure in something, the gas starts to bubble out. It's the same as a, as a can of Coke, right? When you open it up, the gas starts to, to bubble out. So um, the gas oil ratio in the Bakken is going up substantially. And that tells you the amount of oil in there and the pressure in the reservoir is declining very, very rapidly. Um, okay. So on the Bakken, I got some, some comments that, hey, you know, you're not talking about this area of the Bakken that, that's never been exploited or that we have completely opened left. So this is the DJ Basin, another oil basin in, in Colorado. And you can see, even though the basin is this big, only this area is really economic. You can't just point me out to some area that's, that's gonna be economic at $150 oil and say, well, look at this, we got all this, all this acreage sitting around. So, um, you know, just be, just be careful of people who tell you that there's more acreage left. It's not all of your reservoir is, is economic, even at $80 oil. Um, let's talk about Guyana. Um, we'll talk about Guyana supply. So Guyana being one of the big frontiers where, where ExxonMobil and Hess and uh, um, Frontera have been doing some, some exploration work. And you know how much oil are they adding? They're adding roughly 150,000 barrels a day. Again, nowhere close to the 3 million barrels a day required to offset conventional declines. So you know, is it a big frontier in, in development? Agreed, yes. But if it's only adding 150,000 barrels a day, it's, it's really not enough. And you, know, you, you really need a much higher rate and if you look at this projection, when they get to roughly a million barrels a day, they kind of flatline from there. So it's not an area that can add three, four, five million barrels a day all of a sudden and kind of mitigate worldwide declines. It can only go up to a certain point, um, you know, and that's five years down the road. Um, and then we look at the total take from upstream projects. Um, Guyana has one of the biggest rates that the government has taken um, of, the, of the production. Um, I'm not going to claim to be an expert on this, 
there, there's other people telling me that there's a lot of profit sharing agreements and they get to make their money back that they spent on drilling and such. But, you know, this graph tells you the total take from upstream projects and the places we seem to be going to are some of the most aggressively taxed um, regimes out there. You know, Tanzania, Suriname, Brazil, and Guyana are kind of the big four that people talk about, about, about growth in the world oil supply. So if companies are having to go to such extreme places where they're barely making money, what does that tell you about their existing supply in the US and Canada and uh, you know wherever else across the world? Um, okay, so Iran, this was a big one that, that's a big gray area that um, can have a huge impact. And you know, I go through this whole presentation and then people tell me, well, Iran is just going to add 4 million barrels tomorrow and, and your whole thesis is, uh, is stupid. Uh, so, okay. So Iran's internal consumption is about 1.6 to 2 million barrels a day itself. In December and January, and, and this is information from Vortexa who tracks ships, they track uh, crude inventories, they track all kinds of stuff with, with having to do with, with oil movements across the world. Uh, I can't share the data given that it, it's a subscription uh, model, but Iran is exporting 1.1 million barrels in December and January. That's a fact. Um, not 100% a fact, but the best estimation we have from the ships that are that are being tracked and kind of you know analyzed, et cetera. Um, for Texas tracking, I think roughly 200 ships that are uh, not turning on their beacons, that are trying to evade sanctions, that are doing ship to ship transfers. So this is not just like basic analysis. This is deep insight into Iranian supply and what's going on. Um, and Iran is also pulling from inventories. So they pulled roughly 200 to 300,000 uh, barrels a day from inventories December and January. So that tells you they're exporting roughly, you know, eight to 900,000 barrels of production plus their internal consumption. So you get to a point where they're, they're already producing between 2.5 and 3 million barrels a day today. Their max has been roughly 3.7. So if Iran came on today, they would add roughly 700,000 to a million barrels a day. That's it. And that's assuming everything is maintained and ready to go. Like you see how long it took them here to kind of bring production back online. It took over two years for them to get to their peak. So again, anyone talking about Iran and the and it adding, you know, two million barrels tomorrow is just is just selling you nonsense. You look at the data, they can add between 700,000 to, to 1.1, you know, maybe a million barrels a day over the next two years. It's not gonna be instant and it's not gonna be, you know, a, a huge impact suddenly on, on oil supply. Um, with Iran, keep in mind that China is buying oil from Iran at roughly 10 to 20 barrels, a uh, dollars a barrel discount. And they're not gonna be very happy having to pay market price on it. So there's that. And then Israel and Iran have a very interesting relationship. So don't expect this to be a very easy increase. And, and Iran just comes back on the market and they have full uh, capabilities to kind of go, go through with their nuclear program. That's not gonna happen. You're, you're making a mockery of, of Middle East geopolitical um, issues if, if people really think that's the case. Um, the other big gray area, Venezuela, one of the biggest reserves in the world and just an absolute mess right now. Um, you know, all we can do is predict. So Venezuela produced roughly 2.7 million, you can say in the last decade, in the last two decades, that's kind of been their max. Um, they're producing 700 today. So there's a 2 million barrel a day gap that they can, that they can, uh, kind of add to, to world oil supply. But then you look at Venezuelan crude consumption internally because of how, how you know, if a bad state the country is in, the people of the country, the internal consumption has gone down 600,000 barrels. So it, if the country really comes back online and the people start prospering, of the 2 million barrels a day supply that Venezuela can add to the worldwide supply, 600,000 of that is going to be going to um, 
internal consumption. So Venezuela at its best can give you another 1.4 4 million barrels a day. And that's going to take a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of drilling, a lot of worldwide expertise willing to go there, put their lives in danger, uh, put their money in danger to kind of bring it back up to this, this peak. Um, Venezuela's PDVSA, which is their oil company, their debt keeps rising. Um, you know, and look at this comment. Um, Venezuela currently is just firing up fields that are in good condition. But the rest of their fields, not only are they in bad condition, they've cannibalized those. They've they've pulled piping from there, they've pulled compressors and equipment, you know, so it's basically all a mess. And, and it will take a lot of money and a lot of time to bring. 1.4 million barrels a day of production back online at best over three years, over five years. So again, anyone who thinks Iran and Venezuela is just going to come online all of a sudden because oil's at 80 bucks and start jamming out oil, um, it's just not the case. Uh, it's going to take a lot of time, a lot of money, and the actual production that that Iran and Venezuela between them can add is somewhere between two to 2.5 million barrels a day between the two. Most analysts and experts will tell you it's five or six or seven um, million barrels a day. There's a huge, again, a huge difference when you look at what people are telling you and what the data actually tells you. Um, yeah, there's a comment here and a lot of luck. Yeah, you'll need a lot of luck to, to make sure things don't, don't get out of hand. Uh, you know, we already saw a condensate pipeline blow up in Venezuela um, about a week ago now. So, you know, when the when there's oil in the in the country, when there's money to be made, you're gonna have illegal taps. You're gonna have people trying to steal oil and uh, break into refineries and steal equipment and and all this. So, um, yeah, it's not as easy as as one, two, three. Is there any comments on the supply side? Any questions uh, before I kind of wrap this up with with a little bit of a, of a commentary on the rest of the macro that that affects this all? And for anyone on, on Twitter that would like to kind of come up, um, please join the Zoom call because if I take comments on the Twitter, it, it screws up the whole recording, a part of it and, and, and the audio. So um, I'll just request that. And then if not, what I'll do is um, once we take a break here after the macro, I'll, I'll leave the Twitter open uh, for whoever wants to chat on there. Uh, I'll step aside and just kind of let the conversation flow and then come back. Yeah, so um, yeah, 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 no, sorry about that. I, I accidentally opened the uh, the mic there. Um, yeah, so so for anyone on Zoom, I'll I'll keep going here. Um, so just a little bit of, about bank and, and analyst comments. Um, you know, for anyone who, who takes a look at this, um, Morgan Stanley expects oil at at $100 a barrel in the second half of the year. Um, Bank of America is talking 120. Goldman Sachs is back to their $100 prediction. Um, and then RBC's Michael Tran, which is kind of one of the most, one of the guys that's most in tune with this sort of research. It's talking about early days of a multi-year structurally strong cycle. And that's why he's talking about this, this, this bull market structurally because the supply is just not there. The demand keeps going up and the inventories are, are low. So what does that mean? That means unless you have a huge source of supply come online, um, unless you have a huge source of supply come online, this bull market will continue. And, and where are the biggest sources of supply going to be? Well, where can you add two to three to four million barrels a day? Well, maybe offshore, maybe the Canadian oil sands and their long lead very expensive project. So unless 
unless those can come on, the structurally bull cycle will, will continue. It's not just going to be, you know, like I, I keep getting these comments about, oh, oil's 80 bucks now and within six months to be down to 40 again. And, and I just laugh and I just don't say anything because how can you argue with, with somebody who's, who just has the same mindset without looking at the data, without looking at what's changed, what's actually happening. They just keep parroting the same, uh, the same stuff. Um, but anyways, I, I digress a little bit there. Um, yeah, so there's a question here on, there's a comment here on, on Canadian oil names and um, why, why are they outperforming US shale names as demand rebounded? And um, what's going to happen it, and how is material and labor shortage gonna impact them? Okay, um, that's cool. So one of the biggest reasons is the Canadian dollar, of course. The fact that it hasn't moved one-to-one -one with, uh, with the WTI price gives Canadian producers an edge. Um, there's a lot more expertise, I would say, um, in the Canadian oil sands or in the Canadian market that's still available versus in the US, you know, in a way. Um, and then um, there's gonna be material and labor shortage all across the, the industry worldwide. So can Canada really compete and, and how is it gonna affect them? Um, I can't say for sure. What I will tell you is that it's very hard to find labor today in the Canadian oil market. It's very hard to find rigs but there are a bunch of companies that are locked into long-term contracts that I think will continue to, to, to outperform. And the fact that a lot of Canadian companies have conventional production to some sort will also help them. They're not all shaley oil plays. They're, you know, a lot of the, um, the Clearwater, for example, the Sparky, um, the Bakken to some extent is under a deep water flood with, with very low uh, decline rates. Uh, you know, the Montney and the Duvernay are going to have declines, but, but then the oil sands are basically flat. They, they don't really decline all that much. So, you know, companies don't have to spend that much money to kind of mitigate their declines as they have to do in the shale names. So, um, yeah, hopefully that answers your question. Um, and I'll keep going. I'll just point out that, that anyone that wants to kind of see this, this view from a bank, listen to Michael Tran's uh, commentary on oil. It is absolutely bang on. It has been bang on since, since summer of 2020 and, you know, really good research and an understanding of what's going on compared to some of these other banks that are maybe not really oil experts. They, they're just, you know, tourists in a way and they know some data, but they don't really know all the data. Uh, just my opinion. I don't want to make any comments on, on their actual, uh, uh, capabilities. So the party's just getting started. So we look at the S&P, the, uh, the last few um, oil bull cycles went on for a long time and they went on to much higher uh, index levels from the base. So, you know, this one has just started. We're, we're nowhere close to being done yet. Like there's a long ways to go and there's long ways up to go. And again, it's not just going to happen overnight when oil hits, you know, thousand dollars or anything like that. It's going to be a slow and steady rise uh, as more and more uh, data comes to fruition, as more and more inventories decline, uh, the, the supply response is not there, and the demand keeps going up. So it's all a conglomeration of all that. Um, big oil's free cash flow is higher than, than during the hundred dollar crude period seen in 20, uh, 2014. So why is that? Because they're running leaner, their operating costs are, are lower, and because they're not jamming as much capital back into the ground. It's, it's now free cash flow, what used to be spent on capital. Um, oil stocks on sale. So the, um, the um, average price that these companies are kind of trading at right now is, is $58 a barrel. The strip is now actually at $80 a barrel and, and higher. So again, the companies are very undervalued still. Um, we look at energy's market cap to its earnings potential. 
you know, nobody's investing in energy. So this gives you a very, very good opportunity, um, you know, to, to kind of get into this. Like real estate is trading at, at almost four times what energy's uh, price to uh, market cap to earnings is trading at. So, you know, there's, there's a big gap there that has to be arbitraged. It's people want profits. At some point, they're going to come back to these, these industries. It's, you can only have ESG for so long. And then you see your, your other energy friend making a bunch of cash or, or their shares have gone up and you know, you're sitting there in tech or in crypto or whatever. So uh, at some point money talks. Um, so I guess I'll leave it at that. Um, okay. So again, the XLE and the S&P and the WTI used to go hand in hand for a long, long time. And you see every time that it's diverged, it stays there but then it comes back to this same one-to-one -one kind of ratio. Um, and now we've had this extreme divergence. Like this is absolutely insane what, what we're seeing here. And when this is gonna jump back is when the, the hedge funds come back in, the institutions come back in and, and they see these companies trading at 25% you know, free cash flow to EV. I think it's time to come back in. You, you cannot miss opportunities like this. Um, we look at over the last year, the TSX oil and gas e ETF is up 79%. Uh, global clean energy ETF is down 25%. So yeah, a picture is a thousand words, as they say. Um, world population living in extreme poverty. So, you know, for anyone who, who gets back for, for working in oil and gas for the so-called pollution and, and whatnot they've done, um, the, the number of people not living in extreme poverty has just keeps going up and the number of people living in poverty uh, keeps going down. And a lot of that is due to oil and gas and, and, and energy being available to a lot of people. Uh, they're not using manual labor and having to uh, burn cow dung to, to keep warm and stuff. So, you know, a lot of this that we've seen, a lot of the um, increase in the quality of life and and the standard, standard of living of people has been due to oil and gas. So, you know, be proud of what you do. Be proud of the work you've done. And, you know, this is not something to be sitting there and, uh, you know, be, be taking flack from people who don't really understand what's going on here. So the oil industry itself has done a, a pretty poor job at, at showing data like this and, and telling people like, look, you know, you can do all this, all this nonsense you want, but at the end of the day, it's been oil and gas that's that's created this revolution in the in the quality of life of people around the world. Um, so renewables, solar panel prices were supposed to keep going down. So I don't know what happened, but but they keep going up now. Uh, not only have they flatlined, but they have now started rising. So anyone telling you about about battery peak uh, rates and and solar panel rates. Uh, was uh, making projections that that don't that didn't make sense at the time, and they still don't make sense. So, um, so so now that they're making the same projections about about EV uh, saturation and about about the battery price going down ninety percent and such, um, yeah, it, it's going to hit a plateau and it's going to start going up at at some point because demand will start outstripping supply again on those uh, battery metals and, and inflation as well. So okay. Um, energy sources, we see lithium ion, basically zero. And we see diesel, gasoline, and jet fuel between 30 and 40 uh, megajoules per liter and then megajoules per uh, kilogram. So, um, you know, how, how can you possibly compete with something that sits at such a magnitude of difference, two, two orders of magnitude difference in energy density and, and you're trying to compete in terms of energy um, energy supply and energy usage. Um, so this is a Canadian poll and not very surprising. Which, which policies would encourage you to buy an, an EV for your next vehicle? So tax deductions, uh, free stuff, uh, more free stuff and more free stuff. That's basically the reason people buy EVs is because they don't have to pay road tax. Um, they don't have to, 
They don't have to pay road tax. They don't have to pay tax, tax deductions. They get free public charging infrastructure. They get these subsidies. Uh, that's really the only reason people are considering buying EVs. It's not because uh, you know XYZ person wants to save the world. It's because they get cheaper, um, cheaper run rates on their vehicles. So money talks at the end of it. Um, and for anyone who, who does think that EVs are gonna, are gonna take over the world, where are you gonna source the battery metals from? You have copper reaching its kind of supply demand um, peak or supply demand switch from an oversupply to an over demand by 2024. Um, you have lithium, which is kind of the biggest component in a huge supply shortage by 2023, 2024. And you have cobalt, which comes with its own ESG issues that seem to get swept under the rug. And it's in a huge supply demand problem here. Um, so, you know, so the next time you see a graph about uh, EVs are gonna take over the world and grow at exponential rates, uh, screenshot this graph and throw that in there. And, uh, and I'd love to hear an answer of, of where the battery metals are gonna come from. Um, so with the solar panel pricing, uh, same thing with China, lithium carbonate um, through the roof. It's, uh, it's gone absolutely crazy. So it's all getting expensive. Um, if, if electric vehicles weren't expensive already compared to their ICE counterparts, uh, yeah, it's gonna be a lot more expensive. Um, there's a question here, yeah, so hey, go ahead. I just wanted to say, when it comes to the precious metal end of things, there's probably nobody uh, better than three aces that can speak to this. The fellow's got extensive experience. Uh, that That's his background. So maybe, you know, once we open it up Q&A, uh, three aces could maybe, you know, share a little depth. There's a lot of interesting stuff taking place in that sphere. And uh, and that's, you know, the, the majority. So, I mean, I think there's a lot of profound stuff that you would hear from him once he starts sharing. But I'll just uh, quickly uh, uh, just, just leave that with you and, and we can revisit it down the road. Yeah, you betcha. Uh, thanks for sharing that, and and definitely. Um, so now let's talk more detail in Canada and and Canadian producers. I own Canadian producers. Uh, there's talk about windfall taxes, and and the government is uh, doesn't understand what they're doing. Uh, to put it politely, um, energy runs this country. The you can talk about real estate being a huge part of GDP, and banking being a huge part of GDP. When you look at export imports and you look at the merchandise trade balance that Canada has, um, everything else is, is, not, is not really doing anything. It's, it's, it's losing. It's uh, not making the country any money. It's, it's energy. And energy is oil and gas. It's uh, potash. It's, uh, um, uh, I don't know what else contributes to that, but, but those are the big two ones. And they basically are the reason that Canada's merchandise trade balance is, is in the positive. Um, everything else is, is not even holding its weight. It's actually getting worse and worse. So, you know, GDP is, when you say energy is a certain part of GDP, okay, agreed. But when you look at the import exports and where the money is coming from, um, energy is kind of the big, big contributor to that. So I don't think the government is gonna choke its golden, uh, golden goose. Um, Energy shortage, I'll just go through this quickly. Um, there's an energy shortage in everything. It's not just oil and gas. It's people are not spending the money required in renewables, in the electricity network, and in energy efficiency to meet these, these goals that they, they fly in their private jets and they, and they set goals for us, for us peasants. Um, While well, they're not spending money on any of it to make it happen. So, uh, you know, anytime somebody talks about a goal that's more than two or three years in the future, um, yeah, it's uh, it's not really a good uh, good way to to project things. Um, okay, I'll comment on this. So the other pushback I got, and and what I like to do in these seminars is everything I get a pushback for, I try and research and then bring it on in the next seminar to kind of make a comment on that. Uh, one of the unfortunate things is that the seminar just keeps getting longer and longer. And people have only so much of a of a time span of uh, of when they're kind of interested. So, um, but I like to answer questions and I like to deal with things that that people are pushing back on. So, 
um, on the oil market. So people are telling me that, look, you can talk about fundamentals all you want, and it's actually the financial market that's going to tell you where the oil price is going. And I kind of thought about that, and it's true for gold because gold, the the paper market trades more than hundred times, I believe, what the what the physical market is. So I can see that the that the gold price can be manipulated by the financial markets. Well, look at the oil market. The physical oil market is bigger than all the raw metals in the world combined. And by a long shot, like if you combine all of this, it's, it barely makes up a percentage of the physical oil market. You know, gold, the entire gold market is one tenth of the oil market. So yeah, finance, like financial things like the Delta squeeze and the, and the gamma hedging and all this uh, can affect the oil price. But you know what? If there's one commodity where the fundamentals will take over, it's oil. And you can't just produce oil out of thin air. Uh, once, once a barrel of oil is used up, it's gone. It's not like gold, which is just sitting around in, in uh, you know, vaults across the world. That oil is physically gone. You cannot get it back. So those are the two factors, which I think why fundamentals are going to take over for oil at some point. And, and it, anyone talking about... Um, you know, the, the manipulation in oil and such, yeah, to some extent, but when the actual physical market is so tight and there's so much issues with the supply demand, I think it will take over. And, you know, the, the reality will tell you what's going on, the actual physical market. Um, okay. So this one is for anyone that's, that's following graphs, that wants to look at graphs on Twitter. Maybe you're going more into data analytics. You're kind of reading stuff. Um, you know, you're more interested in the oil market, which I've got a lot of people who have who have done a lot of research uh, after after attending these seminars. So, um, props to them. But I saw this graph on the left, and it's it's telling me, you know, somebody had a comment saying that the that the Chinese uh, economy is crashing, and they said, look, look at the Chinese cement production; it's down, you know, more than it has been in the last 20 years, you know, X Y Z. So I decided to look into the actual numbers and. Look what they've done. They've taken the lowest point and they've they've compared it to the highest point ever, and they've thrown that on the graph to make a case for Chinese economy crashing. So um, I don't really have a point to make here on the Chinese cement production. The point I have to make is is look very carefully at the graphs you're reading. Look at the the uh, axes they're using. Look at where the numbers start, the the years, and these year-over-year graphs are very misleading. So. Every time you see a year over year graph, make sure you look at the actual data plotted, you know, on the years. Um, and you can kind of tell who's lying and who's trying to tell you something that isn't actually true um, for whatever reason. I'm not saying this was done uh, for any, you know, manipulative evil reason, but um, the wrong conclusion was made from this left graph. Uh, so, yeah, I'll end it there. The macro outlook. Uh, you know, there's Putin and, and the Saudis who know what's going on. They're screaming. They're telling you that, that oil's in an underinvestment period and they're raking in the cash. Uh, here's the American administration walking in, uh, thinking that they control the room, but they don't actually have any idea of what's going on. Um, these are your tech bros and your crypto guys on their phone uh, who, who, again, don't really understand what's going on. And here's you who's listened in to what these guys are talking about and are laughing with the uh, with the bags of cash that I think are gonna be made here in the market. Um, and I'm invested accordingly to that. Um, okay, so I'll kind of stop there. If there's any questions, um, I'll kind of leave it open here for, for five minutes and then we'll take a 15 minute break. We'll come back at roughly uh, maybe 25 past the hour and then we'll continue with our um, valuation session. Um, just to recap for anyone who wants to participate in the valuation session. The Excel spreadsheet is on the website, whitetundra.ca. Go to the bottom and there's an Excel file there. And you will need the corporate presentations and the Q3 results for Meg, Cardinal, and i3 Energy. Um, if you would like to follow along and if you want to just listen in and, and watch, then feel free to do that as well. So, um, yeah. And then, Kind of just to give an idea of where this is going, um, 
after we do the three companies, I'll open up questions um, on the seminar itself. And then there was some, there was a couple of people on Twitter that wanted to ask about my portfolio itself. So I'll talk about that if, if they're still on the call. And then um, after that, I'll, I'll kind of end it, end the Zoom call and I'll leave the Twitter going for anyone who wants to keep the conversation going on Twitter. Um, you know, we'll kind of have people speak there if they want and, and kind of share their thoughts. I'll, I'll shut up at that point and just let people kind of push back or, or uh, get the conversation going. So yeah, are, are there any questions on the macro itself from the Zoom call here? So, okay, so let's take a 15 minute break on the Zoom call. Uh, we'll, we'll reconvene here at 25 minutes past the hour. Um, and I'll mute myself on Twitter if anyone wants to talk there. Uh, I'm gonna take a break, but, but I'll come back and join in here um, in a few minutes. So yeah, for anyone on Zoom, we'll, uh, we'll come back here at 25 minutes past the hour to continue the valuation session. Thanks. <laughs> 